That's now streaming on YouTube. Brilliant. Thank you. Good evening, uh, members. Good evening, officers. Thank you all for joining us tonight for uh, policy and resources. There are 11 items on our agenda uh, to get through this evening, a couple of presentations uh, as well. Um, this is a uh, remote meeting. Uh, we are streaming live onto YouTube, God willing, uh, and we <laughs> will be doing that for the remainder of, of the meeting. Um, and so uh, we're not in control uh, of the live comment section. So if you are uh, commenting as we go, then please do be considerate uh, of other users. Uh, I will ask members to record their votes verbally. So at that time, I will ask members to unmute themselves uh, and to uh, record uh, their votes, um, in which case we shall kick off. The first item uh, is apologies for absence. We look as though we are a full house. Councillor Headley uh, now uh, on policy and resources uh, as the uh, third Conservative member. So welcome to Councillor Headley uh, to the committee. Uh, agenda item two is declarations of interest. Uh, Councillor Smith, you are indicating. Item six with regards to the local government reform in Essex County Council. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Do I have any other further declarations of interest from members? Councillor Headley. Um, I'm also a county councillor and one of the items includes social care. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Headley. If there are no further uh, declarations of interest, no other member is uh, indicating at this point. So we move on to agenda item three, which are the minutes of our previous meeting that was held on the 22nd of July. Uh, can I ask, uh, firstly, if there are any matters arising from the minutes? Councillor Sullivan, you were first. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Chairman. Uh, I note from the uh, recording of votes in the minutes that Councillor McGurran was absent for three of the votes in what was a very long and important uh, agenda on that day. Uh, so therefore, through you, Chairman, could I ask um, Councillor McGurran that whatever technical issues he had that prevented him from voting on those three items, could he now confirm to the committee that they're resolved? And that therefore, there should be no issue with him voting tonight. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Sullivan, there was no need for any member to uh, justify their voting record or any technical issues uh, that they may have had uh, on, the, uh, on the evening. The uh, only question is whether or not the minutes reflect a true record of the votes, which uh, they do. Uh, do we have any other uh, matters arising? Councillor Baggett, you had indicated. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, looking at the, the minutes uh, on page six, uh, which is uh, item 464, it goes through the report that the committee received on a seller and moving things forward. Now, you will recall um, at that time, I, I said that uh, I felt that the, the seller bid was like to go nowhere and we could probably expect a pushback from the minister. Uh, you said that, um, you weren't sure where I was getting my information from, bro, but I was woefully ill-informed. And I did say that if it turned out that I wasn't ill-informed, um, well, I said that if I was ill-informed, I would do the courtesy of this committee and have the integrity to apologize, um, whether you would do the same uh, should it turn out that I was right. As we see from the item tonight on uh, agenda item six and the uh, supplement, which uh, has a copy of the minister's letter, saying that the Acela bid is going nowhere. I just wondered whether you would fulfill your promise now and have the integrity to apologize uh, for getting it so wrong at the last committee meeting. Thank you, uh, Councillor Baggett. There is a full LGR uh, update later on uh, this evening, which <coughs> I will be uh, giving you a further update. Um, uh, as you have drawn uh, reference to it, we can uh, see on the addendum that was published uh, alongside uh, the report that in the copy of the letter, and I should point out, I'm fully aware uh, of where you were getting your information from. You were reading from a carefully prepared script by Marc Francois. You were aligning yourself with Marc Francois uh, and the position that Marc Francois uh, had taken. Uh, but when we look at the, the letter that came back from uh, the minister, I was obviously told that we were gonna get 
uh, a letter within 24 hours. It was a full uh, week and a bit on from our meeting that we had uh, the letter back from the minister. Uh, but it is very clear in there uh, that whilst he says it is not clear to him on first sight that it would be uh, the right geography, I would be happy to discuss this further. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about how the Thames estuary region is a unique place with unique potential. So I'm unclear uh, from uh, your inference there how a minister writing to a seller to say that he wants to explore uh, the ideas further is, in the words of both you and Marc Francois, a dead deal. Uh, in fact, I think what happened following uh, our meeting was that the minister recognised that the Thames Estuary region is a unique place, that there is a very real uh, opportunity for a seller to take things forward. Uh, and it is clear in that letter that he is inviting further representations from a seller over what the new governance arrangements should be, which we will discuss in more detail uh, in agenda item six. Now, I'm very happy to give way if you do want to come back uh, and to apologise for the fact that the deal uh, is not dead, as you said it would be on the 22nd of July. Councillor Bagger. Well, no, thank you, uh, Councillor. But is it not correct that subsequent to that letter, you sent a letter to residents uh, saying that you no longer thought a combined shadow authority was the way forward and that you were now uh, moving and leaning towards a Thames Gateway model? So if you wrote to residents saying that you didn't think that a combined shadow authority was the way forward, how can you now say that it is the way forward and that you're you were right when, when this was raised with you at, at the last meeting. It just seems a bit confusing from my point of view and, and, and confusing, uh, confusing with the, the narrative that you're giving out uh, to residents when you write to them. Okay, so this is a, a desperate attempt, uh, I would suggest uh, here, to uh, conflate uh, many issues that are uh, at play in what is a complex uh, reorganisation question that we will come to uh, in Agenda Item 6. My view is very, very clear. It has been for three years. I've been very consistent in my view that Basildon should move away from the two-tier uh, arrangements that we have, and we will explain more about that uh, in Agenda Item 6. But I think the crux of your point uh, is that on the 22nd of July, uh, you suggested that the Acela deal was dead and that we would be told by the minister that the Acela deal was dead. And in fact, what we were told by the minister is that he would look at the uh, deal in more detail and that we would come to him reflecting a unique place with unique potential that is the Acela region. So uh, anything but dead, very much on the table and I look forward to coming back to agenda item six where we will talk in more detail uh, about local government reorganisation. Uh, if there are no further uh, minutes, uh, no further uh, additions to the minutes, uh, I'm going to ask members to unmute themselves uh, as we uh, take a vote on recording the minutes as a true and accurate record. And I will kick off by voting in favour and call Councillor Smith. In favour. Councillor Brown. In favour. Councillor McGurran. In favour. Councillor Baggett. It seems the parrot is dead, but yes, I confirm the meetings. Uh, it's a true record. Councillor Headley. I wasn't at that meeting and I can't vote. Abstention recorded. Councillor Sullivan. In favour. Thank you, members. Uh, so the minutes are passed. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item four uh, is looking at the uh, discretionary business grant scheme uh, update. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Rob from Revenues and Benefits to come in and give us an overview uh, of the report that is in front of us. Over to you, Rob. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Yes, an update on the discretionary business grants which we'd administered uh, between um, the COVID pandemic up till up till about two weeks ago, actually. So the report describes um, the response to the council to help local businesses access government support to the COVID pandemic. We've paid out now, um, as of this morning, £30.3 million, pounds, so just over £30 million pounds to our eligible businesses, and that's to 95.5% of those that are eligible to small businesses and retail, leisure and hospitality businesses with our grant scheme. And under the discretionary business grant scheme, we're coming a bit later, the council paid out just over £1.6 million pounds to small and micro businesses. I'll explain a bit more. So 
the small business retail leisure hospitality grants um, came into effect after the government announced on the 11th of March that um, they wanted to help these, these sectors, especially the small business retail hospitality and leisure sectors. There were two grants, a small business grant fund and a retail hospitality leisure and grant fund. And we, the local authority, were made responsible for making these grant payments. The Rose and Benz team designed and commissioned a bespoke online application form to enable businesses to apply for the grant. That way we could capture the correct bank details to the businesses and also further information relating to those businesses that we could share with our partners that we could support them further with. We ran a communications campaign throughout the whole of the period on our website, social media. We proactively contacted businesses by phone and email. When we were allowed to visit, we started visiting these businesses to make sure that they knew they could apply. And so the communication drive for this continued throughout the life of the scheme. So on March the 25th, the new online application form was available and live on our website. We actively encouraged through our social media and Facebook live sessions and Basel and Business newsletters and Basel and Business group sessions. And after due, due diligence of the first application process from those who applied, on the 7th of April, we made our first payments of these grants. And the grants were either for £25,000 or for £10,000. And we paid these direct to the businesses by backs. Um, applications continued to be received and we made payments weekly. And all businesses, whether they were successful or not, were written to uh, by letter and by email to inform them of their success or not. And for businesses that we highlighted as being eligible to claim the grants, um, amazingly, some chose not to apply. Some didn't want the help. Some told us they didn't want to because it was um, impacting on state aid requirements. They weren't eligible. And other businesses actually said, you know, we're not actually suffering. We don't need this money, thank you very much, quite simply. So between the 7th of April and the 28th of August, when the scheme closed, we paid out 525 grants of £25,000, £13.125 million, 10,000 grant, uh, sorry, 1,722 grants of £10,000, which is £17.220 million, pounds, a total of £30.345 million. 95% of eligible businesses within our borough received a grant of £25 or £10,000, which is uh, quite staggering, really. Um, the average across the country was about 94%, so 95.5 was a good percentage for us. The scheme closed as at the 28th of August, which was a Friday, um, and I'll tell you later on in a minute that something else is coming in very soon. So moving on to the discretionary business grant scheme, um, the government brought in a discretionary grant scheme for those businesses that kind of got missed as part of the small business grant and retail leisure hospitality grant fund schemes. It's a discretionary grant fund administered again by us. Again, we commissioned um, a bespoke form so the, the customers, uh, the businesses could apply online. We could capture all the detail. A communication campaign commenced through the council's website, social media, and we practically contacted as many businesses as we could. Um, further clarification was received that self-employed income support scheme customers were eligible now to apply for the grant fund. So that means we had an additional bit of work to do on our form, which we, we changed. Um, but we did have um, a finite amount of grant funding available to us for this, which was £1.665 million for the discretionary scheme. And we decided that we would hold an initial application period for this discretionary money for two weeks. The scheme was agreed a policy resource committee on the 28th of May. And after the first round of applications, and on the 9th of June, we were able to help businesses with either a £10,000 grant or a £5,000 grant if they were a micro business. Again, all businesses were written to if they were successful or not. So we were open and transparent. And we had 141 micro businesses that received £5,000, 77 businesses that received £10,000. So 218 businesses in all that received £1.4 million in the first tranche. We had, after the first tranche, uh, £190,000 left of this finite pot of money. So we held a second window of application, which was for a further week. Uh, once we had all the applications received, which was 34 in total, we paid 34, which was 25 micro businesses, which meant they received £4,400 each, and nine small businesses who received £8,900 each. So we spent all of £1.6 million and helped an additional 252 businesses that couldn't apply for the earlier small business leisure hospitality grant loans and grants. 
Throughout this, we've been working with the uh, counter fraud specialist team at the council. So we wanted to make sure that people were receiving the right grants and that if they were receiving them, they're entitled to them. Um, out of the original grants, I think there were six, six businesses that then we're looking into that there may there may be something for the team to look into, but for the discretionary grants that they were all paid correctly and were entitled to. Um, in addition um, to the above schemes, we've awarded COVID-19 business rate reliefs. So that's the reliefs from government for businesses struggling through the process of 36 million pounds. So in real terms, for your information, that's 28% of Basel businesses this year don't have to pay business rates which is quite a, a staggering amount of help from the government. And there's no options to be considered, I suppose. Any questions, please? Uh, thank you, uh, Rob. I will bring uh, members uh, in as well to, uh, to ask questions, but that is a very, uh, very good update uh, and uh, hugely uh, impressive. And, and again, uh, can I just uh, put on record thank, thanks from, I'm sure, all councillors to the Revs and Ben's team uh, and also to our IT team who had uh, things up and running so quickly so that people were able to, to get on with it and I know uh, Revs and Ben's officers have had lots of very difficult conversations with people um, all over the borough over the last sort of six months now and I think we should be uh, mindful of that this was gone from being a kind of uh, what we thought was perhaps a short-term thing to a, a longer-term thing and, and those conversations will become even more acute in the weeks and months ahead uh, but the pace at which uh, the council was able to move to get those grants into the pockets of those businesses i think was very impressive uh, but at the same time as we've just heard there always being mindful of the risk of fraud and the need to protect the uh, taxpayers pocket uh, and i think again the systems and the policies that uh, were put in place um, uh, have served our businesses well and i hope that um, they will be able to uh, survive the, the months ahead do I have any members uh, who wish to speak? Councillor Baggett has indicated first. Thank you, Chairman. I, I'd echo your remark, uh, your remark and thanks to the officers that have been uh, working very diligently on this. Uh, it's appreciated uh, without a doubt. Um, Chairman, I, I'd actually like to amend the, the, the recommendation. Um, the reason I'd like to amend the recommendation is that, uh, as I've said on more than one occasion, I think that it's incumbent on members to uh, have reports that are not just for noting, and this is very much an administration that likes to note things. Uh, I'd rather actually be more pragmatic and get things done. Um, and, and in that respect, the amendment that I would uh, like to move is that the report is noted uh, and that the leader writes to the government thanking them for their support and informing them how their money has been spent and received by our businesses. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bagger. In the first instance, do you have a seconder for your uh, amendment? Uh, Councillor Headley, I think, is seconding uh, the amendment. Do you wish to speak to the amendment, Councillor Headley? Not at this time, thank you, Leader. No worries. Um, okay, before uh, speaking to that, let me just uh, bring in Councillor Summer. Do you wish to speak to the amendment or the substantive? Uh, the substantive, I wouldn't just speak on. OK, uh, I can assure uh, all members uh, of this council that we are in regular uh, conversations with government, whether it's uh, written correspondence or uh, just this week, uh, both the chief executive and I uh, were on a call with the secretary of state, the minister for local government resilience and, in fact, the prime minister uh, on Tuesday. Um, uh, and of course, we uh, are grateful to them for the work that they've done to help our businesses, as, as Rob has alluded to there. Uh, and we wait with bated breath for what comes in the uh, budget in just a few months time, not only in terms of uh, protecting jobs, sector specific, uh, and I know the Prime Minister was asked about that this afternoon at the uh, Liaison Committee about sector specific support and help, um, but we will also look at what the government will do to, to make good on its promise to reimburse councils for every single penny that was spent uh, and lost in income uh, as a consequence of the coronavirus crisis at the moment it is uh, less than 50 percent that they have given back uh, to councils across the country uh, so i hope that they will uh, make good on that promise that they made to us in yeah, in those hours but do i have any uh, other member who wishes to speak to the amendment that has been tabled no in which case i will put the amendment uh, to the vote so if i can ask uh, members to unmute themselves uh, I will start by voting against the amendment. Councillor Smith? Against. Councillor Brown? Against. 
Councillor McGarren. Against. Councillor Baggett. For. Councillor Headley. For. Councillor Sullivan. For. Thank you. The amendment is lost, in which case I will come to Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just a couple of questions of clarification, really. Um, on, on page 20, for the officers, uh, on page 22, um, it says that the Council's counter fraud specialist team are carrying out additional investigations into any applications to see whether it's been uh, used for financial gain. Obviously, it's been in the news, um, the potential that's been lost um, nationally through fraud, uh, through uh, these government schemes. So uh, could Rob or any other officers let us know if there's been any, if there is any update on these investigations. Um, and in the second question, also page 22, um, under the financial implications, it notes uh, the new burdens funding of 170,000 has been received to support the administrative costs costs of delivering the NMDR and council tax relief. Um, would uh, one of the officers be able to tell me if that has in fact been su uh, sufficient to to cover our costs, or if if in fact we uh, we, we still have to um, uh, use it all up? Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Simons. I'll bring Rob in to, to answer the first one, and then on the second point, I think. Uh, perhaps Owen wants to touch on this, but I do think it is worth an ongoing view of what uh, COVID is doing longer term to business rate collection and, and where we will end up and what we're forecasting for, for the budget as well. And perhaps we want to touch on that. But first, uh, if I come to you, Rob. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, out of this, out of the 2,247 grants that we've awarded, um, only, only six have been flagged as having maybe a minor issue and to be worth looking more into. I know the the, uh, the counter fraud team are doing work on them currently. I haven't had an update and they won't update me because it's out of my hands now and that will come from Paula and her team. But they are looking into whether they're entitled, whether the banks are for the right people, whether the businesses were trading as they said they were trading. There's a number of things they'll be looking at. And it won't be it won't be a very it won't be a quick thing to come back and tell you I'm afraid. Can I just uh, confirm that we're talking about audit and risk there, are we? Are yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that will be a potential for audit risk to, to take on, but perhaps in the fullness of time when they've had an opportunity to do that. Uh, on Councillor Sullivan's uh, second point, Owen, around, uh, oh, sorry, Rob, do you want to talk about whether or not uh, we have exhausted all of the pot of money that uh, is available to us or what we're going to do to perhaps target that remaining 5%? So the, the, the actual scheme closed on the 28th of August, so the money we spent now is, is, is what we spent. Um, or as, what I could update you on now is that last week the government have announced there's going to be further support for, for businesses um, if they impose or if the health and social, social care secretary imposes local lockdowns. Um, so if, the, if there is a local lockdown of, of um, for Basildon, we will be looking at awarding um, further grants of either a thousand pounds or fifteen hundred pounds for a period of three weeks at a time, for depending on how long the local lockdowns last for, and that's only come out. Uh, I think last Wednesday we've had some draft detail through this morning, so this is this is still very very fresh, and we're still waiting for the final detail to come through. But um, that's that's what we're looking at at the moment, and there will be a very small percentage of that of which we could will now be able to help um, through discretionary funds as well. For businesses who, who don't pay business rates. So very similar to the two previous schemes on a much smaller level of finances, but um, uh, for a short period of time, so three weeks at a time. Uh, thanks, Rob. And I think also um, it is worth noting that uh, we are going to add in to the October, when we get to, into the work programme, uh, a full uh, report on our lockdown uh, plan uh, and what uh, would happen uh, in terms of a local lockdown. So I think members should see sight of that. And of course, uh, that will feed into uh, what Rob has just said, will feed into the council's response at that time. Councillor Sullivan, do you want to come back? Not so much come back. The, the specific question was, the second question, the new burdens funding of 170,000 to support administrative costs. Was that sufficient or have we had to top that up or have we still got any more? Just that specific question. Thanks. Owen? Yeah, so um, it's sufficient to meet the costs we've incurred so far, so system upgrade costs, overtime costs, 
otherwise alluding to what Rob said, that work, additional work that the services are, on, are delivering is still ongoing. So obviously we monitor it as an ongoing basis, but we don't monitor them side by side. So the additional costs we've met so far, yeah, it meets that, but it just depends obviously how that unfolds over the next few months, the next grant scheme, and what really unfolds during the rest of the year. Thank you. Councillor Sullivan, any further questions? No, okay. Any other member wish to uh, come in uh, on this item? No, okay. Uh, in which case, uh, it, the report is uh, for noting. Uh, thank you uh, to Rob uh, and team for that report. Uh, our next uh, agenda item, uh, which was uh, a legacy report that we'd asked for previously, uh, which looks at the one source enforcement arrangements. Uh, and the update is on pages 25 uh, to 29 of our agendas uh, tonight. And this gives us, again, an overview uh, of where we are up to in terms of the changes that we have made uh, last year uh, as a committee to our debt collection arrangements. Uh, and I'm going to hand back to Rob uh, to talk through the substantive uh, substantive report. Rob? Thank you, Jeff. Yes, yeah, so in uh, September 2019, we switched our enforcement of unpaid debts from private bailiff companies and we delegated to the London Borough of Newham under a shared service umbrella of one source. Um, it's resulting in additional income from the council through fees that would otherwise have gone to the private sector and there is additional service benefits and benefits for our residents. The council's enforcement function for external collection of unpaid council tax business rates and sundry letter invoices has been delegated to London Borough of Newham and all of our council business rates and subject invoices are sent a bill to tell them first of all the need to pay. We always give them the opportunity to have a payment arrangement to pay the debt. Um, staff are always available to assist customers in person or by telephone, on the internet or by email. We, we also carry out home visits where appropriate. Throughout all stages of our recovery process, staff provide full assistance. They help them making claims for additional support, help them um, opening basic bank accounts, they help them with hardship funds that are available. And we also have a community engagement offices that will, will, will sit with the customer to maximise their benefits, reduce their bills, assist with their finance and budgeting. We also hold debt busting roadshows um, virtually now, but we did hold them in the Basden Centre, as well as payment and advisory clinics, all, all to support the customer into paying rather than, than trying to hide away from their debt. But previously, where payment was not received, and if we weren't able to make deductions direct from the, the uh, customer's wages or from their ongoing certain benefits, or we would consider passing the debt to one of our previous three external private enforcement agents. They were previously known as bailiffs, but they're now called enforcement agents. This didn't cost the council, didn't cost us financially, but the enforcement agents charged a fixed fee to the debtor, um, which and these fees are set out in legislation. So £75 fee for compliance, £235 for enforcement, and £110 for sale or disposal of goods. So the table shows on the report that the additional income the council we have received from fees charged. So from the period of October to March 2020, we had a target of £75,000 in fees to Basildon as income from the fees collected. We actually collected just over £69,000. And from April to June, um, obviously the income is significantly lower because we, um, we suspended all enforcement action due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and the income we received from debtors, which is still six and a half thousand pounds, was from debtors who contacted one source and said, I still want to pay my debt. I don't want it uh, increasing over time. So the income from fees charged now comes back to us. And obviously um, the council can reinvest those fees back into the borough rather than into the pockets of private companies, which is, I hope you can see a good news story. Um, due diligence has shown that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, a new council ongoing performance was consistent, if not slightly better than private sector enforcement agents. And obviously we still continue to monitor, monitor collection and performance from them. So with the delegated enforcement function with one source that's now has been established for a period of time, we have seen the following additional benefits. We've got improved communication between the debtor and the council and one source staff. We are now to establish those who just won't pay from those who can't pay, and it gives us an early opportunity to support those customers who may be vulnerable and can't pay. We also have a regular drop in debt advice surgeries, and these are now virtual. With the Revs and Benz team, we work very closely with the Housing Needs team, Citizen Advice, and our local job centre colleagues. 
And one source um, as an authority also have their own professionally dedicated welfare advisors who work closely with our own welfare team. And we, we continue to support residents with their debt management plans and we're setting up personal budgeting. That really does suit the uh, residents' unique situations. Not everyone can pay what we want them to pay. So sometimes getting enough is, is better than getting none. There is a case study attached, which I'm sure you've seen, but just gives an idea that we, you know, we don't hit everyone with a hard big stick. We do support customers and we try to do what we can to make sure we, we receive the income, but make sure the customers are supported at the same time. Happy for any questions. Uh, cheers, Rob. Thank you again. Another uh, good report uh, and uh, clear explanation. Uh, members, uh, I'll open this uh, up. Uh, if there is anyone, Councillor Smith. Can I just, through, through the chair, Mr Chairman, thank Rob, Rob and his team. It's been fantastic. I mean, normally during the sub, sort of July, August time, I get no more than three constituents contact me, typically every year, to say they've had problems, they're getting the nasty letters, it's going to call, there's fees to pay for a private company. And this year, I've had one resident contact me in a panic, worried, in a real stressful state about owed council tax. So if I'm not getting complaints from constituents and asking for help, obviously it's working. And on the figures on page 25, money-wise, it seems to be working as well. So through the chair, Mr Chairman, thank you ever so much, Ron. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, uh, a good news story, but I'll, I just wanted to make the point. Uh, I think I made it the last time this came to the committee. This is exactly the sort of item that should go to a scrutiny committee. Um, it's a potentially controversial uh, policy and activity, direct impact on people's lives. Um, and a scrutiny committee could look at the activities and experiences of, of the debt collectors and also the, uh, the debtors themselves and further recommendations could be made. Um, I don't believe there's oversight via um, this committee or indeed any committee um, in the same way that a scrutiny committee could do that. We've just been given the bare facts to note, given one example case, but really we're not scrutinising the um, operation of this policy. And I think, as I said, this specifically because of its uh, potentially controversial activity would be the sort of thing that I think members uh, would like to really get have more of an in-depth discussion and report on and one that would uh, result in votes rather than just noting there can be other items like this but this again is is one uh, as I said before that really we need a scrutiny committee to look at this sort of thing and I don't believe that our committee provides that but I just wanted to make that point thank you Thank you, Councillor Sullivan. I, I don't wish to preempt what I'm sure uh, will come later in the work programme, but of course, uh, the work programme is available to all members of this committee uh, to put onto the work programme any report that they want to see. We were asked, uh, I think by you, Councillor Sullivan, to come back to the committee with an update report. We had an in-depth report looking at one source in September 2019. We were asked to come back. Clearly, COVID has slightly delayed that, but we've come back uh, within a year to look at the first round of figures here. Uh, if there are any pertinent questions that you have, I'm sure Rob uh, and his team will be delighted to answer them either tonight or if you want a more detailed report. When it comes to the work programme, feel free to raise it then. Uh, we can get into the detail of exactly what it is that you need to know, you want to know, uh, and how the policy can be improved. So that will be the forum, and I look forward to your full support and encouragement when it comes to the work programme. I'll let you come back in and then we'll go to Council Brown. Well, thank you, Chairman. Um, we've come, it's come to the committee twice now. Um, I'm using this as an example. There will be many others which could go to a scrutiny committee and I believe that the general operation of scrutiny committees is something that this council misses. We can't bring every single item and report that we ever see in this committee back to it again, again and again continually. And even then, when we brought this one back again, it's for noting. So I asked you to come back, it's for noting. So it's not of an ilk, and I was a scrutiny committee chairman for many years, it's not of an ilk that I would have had come to a scrutiny committee. Uh, so I don't think there's, there's any point in, having, in keep bringing it back to this committee because if this is the type of report we're going to get, 
then is, is not going to be of, uh, of, of the sort of report that a, that a scrutiny committee would have had. Thank you. Okay, you've made the point. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Brown does no longer wish to speak. Uh, so Councillor Harrison is indicating. You're on mute, Dave. I take exception, I take exception to Councillor Sullivan's last remarks. This is not the sort of report we should be looking at. I think this is an excellent report, which Rob Mance has put forward. I fully understand it. And rather than sit here and ask or say, we don't like the way you're operating, now's the opportunity, Councillor Sullivan. If you're not happy with the report, ask the questions now. Scrutinise it. Ask Mr Manser. But just to say, I don't like the way we're doing it, that's not the answer. Be, pro be proactive, not reactive. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Harrison. I, I'm not going to get into a, a tit for tat on, on this. I, I agree entirely with uh, the point that Councillor Harrison makes, which is why I said at the beginning I thought it was a good report and it was uh, very clear in the way that it was presented. And it should be noted that these reports go out a week in advance. Uh, every member of this committee has an ample opportunity uh, to get in touch. It says on the top of the report, inquiries to whichever officer uh, is on that report and, and any member can can get into the detail and, and start asking those questions and it can come uh, to the committee. So, um, you know, I'm not going to get bogged down in process tonight on this. We are a committee system. There is a, a real opportunity here in a public forum to uh, scrutinise. But uh, I think part of the problem here is that the policy that this administration enacted is demonstrably working uh, and it is a, a real success a uh, year on. Uh, and that is all credit to uh, Rob, uh, Owen and the team. So please do uh, relay our thanks uh, back to the team. Um, this report is uh, just... Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Headley, are you waving at me? Yeah, sorry, Leader. Um, can I just, as a point of clarification, uh, one source, the um, collection agency, they are charging the same fees as noted in the report. Yes, just to confirm that they're standard fees, which all enforcement agencies are, um, charge across the country. So it's flat fees across the country. So that's how they manage the, their resource, yes. by collection of fees. Absolutely. And those fees are identical to the fees that the previous private sector bailiffs would have been charging. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're, they're monitored by um, a, a, a board called Civia, and the, the fees are set le through legislation, and they can't, they can't change those fees. It's the same for everyone. Okay, so Newham Council and one source, they're taking on the risk of doing work that they don't get paid for if the debtor fails to comply with the order. Absolutely. Thanks. And there was an example of scrutiny. Owen, uh, you were waving. No, I think Rob picked it up. I was just going to just pick up the statutory fees and that's why they're set at that level. Rob covered that. Thanks, Chair. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Feel free to stay. You don't have to uh, for the remainder of uh, the meeting. Um, but we're going to move on to agenda item six, which is local government reform. Uh, and we're going to have a presentation that I'm going to take the committee through. And then at the end uh, of that presentation, uh, we will uh, take questions and get into a, a Q&A. Uh, so, uh, Paul, can I ask you to share the screen? Thank you, members. Can you see the screen? No one is dissenting, so I'm going to believe you can. Can someone just actually say you can see it so that I know you can see yeah. it? I can see yeah, it. Yes. We can see it. Yeah, see it. Okay, all right. So um, this uh, agenda item, the clue is in the title, Local Government uh, Reform. Uh, and there is a report uh, that uh, members have received. Um, there are uh, several key elements uh, that we need to be mindful of when we are talking about local government reform. Uh, this is a move uh, to simplify local government uh, and the uh, government governing party, the Conservative Party uh, in Westminster, had a series of uh, manifesto commitments. Um, what they are seeking to do in terms of the uh, reorganisation thus far is to simplify the two-tier system uh, and favouring uh, unitary authorities uh, in their approach. We have seen uh, in various examples around the country, in Bournemouth Christchurch in Paul, uh, in Northampton, in Buckinghamshire, in Suffolk, uh, 
uh, we have already seen uh, a number of examples of where the government have already sought to do this. Uh, they are also looking at combined authorities with directly elected mayors uh, and engaging in 30-year uh, investment deals, uh, mainly for infrastructure uh, and for larger scale projects that are uh, across borough boundaries. Uh, and they are looking at the uh, full weight of powers, uh, responsibilities and uh, uh, financial spending power uh, of regions as well as of individual councils uh, and parish and town councils. We are expecting the government to publish uh, its white paper uh, this autumn. There had been soundings. It could be as early as the end of September. Uh, members will be aware there was a change of minister uh, in the last 10 days or so at the Department for MHCLG. Um, but it is still expected that the white paper uh, on local government uh, reform uh, and recovery uh, will be coming out this autumn. Uh, there has been uh, already tonight, tonight debate about letters and, and it does appear that we send uh, not just on LGR but on COVID and on uh, a whole manner of things a number of letters uh, backwards and forwards to government but in respect of, of where we are at the moment on a cellar uh, there was a letter that was sent uh, to uh, the then Minister Simon Clark uh, on the 30th of July and that letter uh, was also accompanied uh, on the 31st of July uh, by a uh, economic growth prospectus and this committee on the 22nd of July approved that prospectus uh, to go to government uh, and I confirm it was submitted on the 31st of July. Uh, we have not yet had a formal response to the economic prospectus uh, but we did receive a reply uh, from the letter that was sent uh, in advance of that prospectus uh, which we've covered uh, slightly tonight which the Minister uh, suggested that on first reading, uh, the, uh, geog the geography, the geographical area of South Essex uh, on uh, first reading did not look big enough for a combined authority, but that the minister would look at every individual case and recognise the unique nature and the unique potential of the Thames Estuary region, uh, and he committed to engaging with us uh, going forward. There's also been letters uh, between Essex County Council uh, and I think it is important that we understand uh, what has actually happened in terms of establishing a political mandate. Uh, both myself and Councillor Baggett uh, have led this council and therefore had taken a seat on a cellar. Uh, and that decision to form a cellar uh, formally through a memorandum of understanding was taken in January 2018. There has been uh, several budgets and there have been several rounds uh, of uh, committee decisions uh, in the intervening period that has given legitimacy and a mandate to a seller to be able to conduct exploratory work uh, around a whole manner of different uh, work streams, whether that be skills and education, whether that be the economic growth and economic development, whether that be the joint strategic plan that the previous administration adopted uh, into our local plan, whatever it might be, uh, there has been a mandate established. Uh, what we have seen in the in the last uh, six or seven weeks or so uh, is a, uh, a county council that have approached the government uh, in a meeting to uh, explain to them their uh, initial thinking about reorganisation. That has been followed up with a letter from the minister uh, to the leader of Essex County Council saying that, thank you for your suggestion, please send it to me in more detail and I will have a look very similar, you might say, to the letter that he sent to the Acela leaders, where he said, similarly, send me something in more detail and I will have a look. I paraphrase, but that is in effect what was said to both Acela and to the County Council. Uh, if we move on uh, to the next uh, slide, we will see that on the 31st of July, uh, that was the first time in which uh, all leaders and chief executives across the County of Essex were brought together. Uh, and at that meeting, uh, the Chief Executive uh, and the uh, leader of Essex County Council informed leaders uh, of the decision that they had taken to embark on reorganisation work that would see the County Council abolished. Uh, now, what has subsequently happened since the 31st of July is that there has been a shift in position. Uh, we, at the beginning, uh, came to an agreement that there would be a proposal that we could unite behind, although it may not carry unanimous agreement, there could be majority agreement, and that would be the proposal that would be submitted to government uh, and in timelines that I will explain uh, shortly. 
but that that proposal uh, would have the best chance of success if it carried a majority of support. Uh, in the two weeks uh, between the 31st of July and the subsequent session uh, of the uh, leaders and chief executives, it has been suggested by uh, the county that actually uh, it doesn't matter that there may be multiple proposals going into government, they are going to plough ahead with their proposal. And they have told us that they are looking at creating one combined authority for the whole of Greater Essex, and that they are looking at uh, unitary uh, compositions of between two and four councils. Now, I don't need to tell any member or officer on this uh, call that there is a huge difference between two councils and four councils. Uh, Essex is just shy of two million people as a county. Uh, a uh, to have a unitary authority, uh, or sorry, a, com a unitary authority of two would mean that you would be pushing almost a million people per council. Uh, that would be uh, putting us on a level with Birmingham City Council uh, that currently stands at 1.1 million people uh, and which is widely regarded uh, within local government as far too big and cumbersome to make decisions and drive change. Um, the idea that we would then seek to create not one but two similar sized authorities in Essex uh, is, I would suggest, um, uh, for the birds really, uh, and it is uh, what the government are suggesting, though they haven't confirmed this, is that it would also fall uh, foul of an upper limit that they may or may not put into the white paper that is around the 500 to 600,000 mark. Uh, if that was the case, then you would be looking at unitary authorities uh, in number of around four to five uh, in Essex. Uh, however, the County Council are continuing to press ahead. They have uh, commissioned work uh, and consultants to start looking at local government reorganisation. Uh, they are, uh, at this moment in time as we speak, uh, they are looking at how they can abolish Basildon Borough Council, uh, merge us uh, with uh, many other different councils in many other different uh, guises and they're working up the uh, baseline for how they're going to do that and that's because they are determined to be in the first tranche of reorganization and I will talk more about the timeline uh, in a moment. Uh, we believe uh, as an Acela group but actually it is now Acela plus and there are a, a growing number of councils across Essex uh, that mean the overwhelming majority of councils in Essex are against one combined authority for Greater Essex with two or three unitaries, they believe there is a majority opinion that that is not the right model of governance for the county. Uh, and we are working uh, regularly. Indeed, there is another round of leaders and chiefs meetings uh, across the county next Thursday to see if there can be a more collaborative approach whereby Essex County Council uh, co-commission some of this work rather than racing ahead, uh, bringing in consultants to do work uh, which will be uh, very much doing things to Basildon Council and other district and unitary councils rather than working with the other councils. And uh, I have to say in the three meetings that we have had, uh, the, the key question still remains, uh, are we working together to put one proposal into government that can carry majority opinion? Or are we turning up to these meetings to be told what the County Council are proposing to do to us. And that distinction, I have to say, unfortunately, is still something of a grey area right now. Uh, if we can move on to the, the next slide. Um, we have been uh, very much uh, on the front foot uh, as a council here in Basildon, but also as a South Essex uh, region. Um, and the approach uh, across the uh, different areas of Essex is, as you would expect, uh, different as a result. In the south of Essex, we have been exploring uh, what uh, collaboration may mean for some time. We have a joint strategic plan, for example, that is adopted into our LDP. Uh, there has been considerable collaboration between uh, our councils uh, on a number of, uh, of different projects, such as the uh, fibre broadband that's running uh, from Thurrock down to South End and the bid into government uh, for some of that uh, funding. Uh, and so in many, in many senses, we're further ahead in our thinking and our collaboration and perhaps some of our partners in different parts of the county and as a consequence of that uh, there has been a bit of a mismatch in where people are at and where people are comfortable in bringing their councils along.
but it is important that we are bringing people with us rather than, as I say, uh, being done to by those on high. Um, we're continuing to uh, work with ECC, but uh, it is important to understand uh, that data sharing agreements um, must be developed across all councils, including ECC. They must be uh, a partner in this, so they must uh, be sharing their data so that we can undertake a proposal based on evidence as well to counter whatever it is that they put forward. And similarly, um, when it comes to the two unitaries of Southend and Thurrock, uh, the county will not be able to put a robust proposal into government without their data as well. So uh, that is being worked on at the moment, but I'm confident that we'll get to an, a, a position very soon where we can have a data sharing agreement between all councils in Essex. Uh, I mentioned earlier on the timeline that we are working towards, and this is a very, very quick timeline, and there can be uh, no those members who joined the member uh, working uh, the member uh, briefing on Monday evening that I've requested that we hold uh, will have seen this uh, for themselves. Uh, the government, uh, as I say, is bringing forward uh, its its white paper. It is expected when it announces the white paper that there will be some areas of the country where they are uh, already looking to uh, adopt LGR, uh, and they will be um, as part of that first tranche. Uh, but there is also uh, a need for us to get a move on. We know that the County Council plan to put a submission to government uh, for what the new look council areas in Essex will be before Christmas Day. So this time, this side of Christmas, there will be a proposal that sits on the Minister's desk uh, about whether or not to change the current composition of governance in Essex from where we are today to a model that is between two to four unitary authorities with one greater Essex combined authority. Therefore, given that there is a majority opinion against the County Council's view of creating supersized uh, unitary authorities and one greater Essex combined authority that would put enormous power into the hands of one person, uh, meaning that they could potentially ride roughshod over things like uh, housing and planning and infrastructure and all those things that we have a legacy problem with in this county where investment invariably goes to the north of the county and not to the south. That could be exacerbated rather than um, uh, dealt with in LGR. And that's widely recognised across the county. So uh, what we will need to do if we cannot get agreement from ECC to put one proposal in is we will have to run in parallel against their proposal with our own uh, proposal and that will also need to go to government this side of Christmas and the idea then is that the minister will determine which proposal uh, they are going to go to consultation with the public on uh, and that will be done in early 2021 with legislation creating the new councils to be laid uh, and voted on as early as June July 2021. Uh, if that was to happen uh, as was explained in the member briefing uh, on Monday evening, uh, the idea then would be that a shadow council, whatever that unitary authority is, uh, would uh, be up and running for May 2022. There would then look to have elections to that new council in May 2023, and then there would look to have mayoral elections for the combined authorities in May 2024. So members need to be clear in their own minds that unitary will come before combined authority in the, chrono in the chronology of uh, this LGR. If we can move on to the, the next one, Paul. Oh, Paul. Have we gone off here? Paul, are you there? We're just going to the good bit and all. Karina, are you there? Is he, is yeah, I think he's, it looks like he's left the mate. Oh, he's come back in. No, he's left his back. I'm pleased Sorry, connecting there, leader. You're on the right slide. Uh... Yeah, I'm pleased you went and not me, so I don't have to repeat all that. 
Do you want me to move on? Uh, if you can share your screen and then we can go on to the next one, yeah. Apologies. Uh, I think. Um, so one after that. Next one. Next one. Yeah. Okay. So uh, members, there, there's obviously a need for Basel and Council to respond. Uh, five or six miles away from the borough boundary, there are uh, officers uh, at the County Council who are now working up uh, proposals for what will happen to our Council. Um, we are working uh, every single day on LGR uh, at this moment in time, um, but it will be important for us as a Council to establish uh, our, negotiation, our negotiated position uh, and there are several reasons for that. I am uh, very concerned uh, at this moment in time that we are running away, uh, or the county is running away, uh, spending an awful lot of taxpayers' money uh, on consultants to draw up a proposal um, that has not been co-commissioned by anyone else across uh, Essex. Uh, similarly, I'm also concerned that considerable sums of money could be spent on an alternative proposal that in six months time never sees the light of day because it never uh, gets the support of government. The preferred position is obviously for us to put one joint proposal that carries the majority view uh, into government. But if that is not uh, able to happen, we have to work in the best interests of our, our residents. So we will continue to develop our proposals. But I think what is now a matter of urgency for us uh, is to start to flesh out what the policy frameworks are uh, that is acceptable to us as councillors here in Basildon uh, as we move forward. And I agree that, or I, I concede that at the moment, that will be more around principles uh, and that there will be some people that will say, we must wait for the white paper. Um, I have to say with the greatest of respect, that is now not an option uh, because of the speed with which the county uh, are progressing. So if we move on to the, the next one, uh, Paul, uh, you will see in your uh, agendas tonight, uh, we've outlined uh, seven principles for local government reform that if adopted by uh, the council tonight will form the basis of the initial policy framework and what i would say to members is this can be changed and this can be reformed as we move through this process in the weeks and months ahead but clearly uh, we accept that there is a shift in the position around population the government has been um, pretty extensive in its um, in its leaks over the summer that it will look to uh, unitarise councils, but with a starting base of 300,000. So uh, just shy of 200,000 in Basildon would mean that we were short of that target. So there is an acceptance from the administration that a single Basildon unitary authority is now no longer uh, a concept that the government will entertain. And therefore, uh, it will mean that there will have to be some form uh, of a merger. Um, so 300,000 is the minimum that the government are putting forward, uh, and we are suggesting that 500,000 would be the maximum population uh, that should serve uh, the new council. And that links to the second point, which is a need to protect democratic accountability. Uh, we are, uh, as a country, um, we have the least elected representatives of any uh, Western democracy uh, anywhere in, in the Western world. Uh, and the idea that you can reduce, which will happen, the number of councillors overall, but you have um, a, a greater ratio between councillor and resident, um, there will be a need to ensure that we protect that democratic uh, accountability. Um, we making spelling errors <laughs> as we go. Okay. Um, uh, then we talk about a sensible geography as well. Um, so again, uh, there will be, we believe, two. Uh, fairly vague um, references in the white paper uh, to uh, meaningful geographic areas and functioning economic areas. Uh, and therefore, we must now start to think about where do people in our, in our borough live, where do they work, where do they travel to socialise, uh, what is a sensible uh, geographic area, and that will be something that we need to take an opinion on as a council. And I don't propose, by the way, that we have the answers to these questions here tonight. 
I believe that serious work needs to be done with members uh, to flesh this out. Um, we also talk about the fact that, as I say, the councils need to be functioning in economic areas uh, and that we also need to ensure that we get the best out of every pound spent. It is not, uh, it has not been a surprise to me and it hasn't gone unnoticed uh, in local government that the only councils that have found themselves in a position to serve section 114 notices thus far uh, have been county councils. Uh, there's also a view that just because councils are bigger does not necessarily mean a they are more financially sustainable or that b they deliver better services for residents and businesses and finding that happy equilibrium uh, is a key thing for us to do in the policy uh, framework that we set uh, we also know that combined authorities are essential we know as councillors that infrastructure is the watchword that every single person wants to talk to us about and I've said many times before, no individual borough or district council can put their hand on their heart and say that they are going to ever have the money to be able to, on their own, deliver the levels of infrastructure spend, particularly in the southeast of England, where we know just how expensive life is down here. There is no way that on our own we'll be able to deliver all of the infrastructure that is needed in our local plan or indeed in any of the local plans uh, around uh, Essex. Therefore, a combined authority with a uh, carefully negotiated investment deal over a uh, long period of time, a 30-year period of time, if you follow the examples that have been set elsewhere in the country, uh, there is a, a real opportunity for our part of the world, our region, uh, to get the infrastructure spend that we need, but that will mean a combined authority. However, we do also believe that they must be linked to the geography uh, and they must be able to deliver on the infrastructure needs and, and when you look at South Essex despite the fact that we are only one fifth of the land uh, mass within the county of Essex we are half the population we are half the uh, economy if not more uh, of the county of Essex so therefore um, this part of, of our of our county uh, should be able to uh, punch well above its weight and then in terms of putting residents at the heart of any future proposals I think that this is a key thing for us to do during that consultation phase uh, make sure that the um, options are presented to the public and not um, the fate accompli that is uh, currently being worked up in County Hall uh, and just uh, presented to government as the only option and therefore the one that uh, they should uh, uh, enforce in legislation. I think we need to be much more uh, prudent about involving residents and businesses uh, in whatever the LGR form uh, takes in Essex. So what we do know at this stage is that ECC uh, are developing that proposition at pace they do plan to submit that to government by the end of this calendar year um, and that there are a range of options that are in the process of being developed between two to four unitaries and between one and two combined authorities uh, and that will need to be underpinned by data and evidence which we are working on uh, being able to share and establish in a lawful and uh, meaningful way at this moment in time. Uh, what we don't know is the actual contents of the pending devolution and local recovery white paper. There is potentially some rowback uh, that we've seen in the press uh, and I, I do just say to members this is a constantly changing uh, feet uh, every single week. Uh, there are different layers of complexity being added to the LGR process and to the deliberations that leaders are, are having to uh, weigh up. Um, all of the details around the various options are not yet known because frankly if we can't get hold of each other's data how can we properly model children's adults highways and all of those spends similarly how can uh, some councils that don't have housing stock and uh, don't have um, the, uh, the the waste services that we do, how do they model uh, what they do uh, in their areas versus what we do in our areas. And we need to be mindful that linked to this white paper, the government have very deliberately added recovery uh, and they are looking for uh, long-term local government resilience to be born out of recovery. Now, that could mean one of two things. It could mean um, that they want to actually form sustainable financial councils that uh, are meaningful in their geographies and functioning economic areas or if we are not careful it will be a slash and burn job uh, of the very services that we uh, hold dear and I think the the key thing for us to recognize here is that what we in the short term seem to be fighting against is local government reform versus regional government reform uh, any move to create a council that is in excess of half a million I would contend is moving us away from having a local council to having a regional council uh, and we need to be mindful uh, of that um, so this is a continuously evolving picture 
I don't know at this stage, Paul, if either you or the chief executive uh, wish to add anything uh, to what I have said. We will circulate this afterwards to members, although much of it was on the uh, member briefing on Monday uh, that members were able to attend. Um, but if we could stop sharing the screen now, I'll be able to uh, see people on screen. Um, and to just add, before I bring members in, if Paul or Scott, do you have anything to add at this stage? Scott? Yeah, um, uh, uh, thank you, Leader, uh, for what, what is, uh, as you rightly said, a, a moving feast. And, and at the moment, they are daily, if not uh, twice daily, conversations and meetings. And just, just as, as the moving feast you said there, we have only today agreed the data sharing protocol that you described uh, earlier. Uh, and we hope that will be hosted by Castle Point, uh, where it's a shared hub that everyone can have access to that data, as you described earlier. Uh, and predominantly the Essex Finance Officer Group would be custodians of that data, where they'll share that, uh, uh, as you said earlier. Um, and similarly, uh, although you're right to say that the, the county are looking at two to four, two other councils in, in Chelmsford and um, Colchester have asked for them to model up to five uh, um, unitaries, and we wait to see that change in, in what county uh, could look at as part of that. I suppose my only other point really to, to add to what, what you've said is uh, one, and I said this on Monday, the, the amount of resource that will go into this in a very short space of time is not to be underestimated. Members, uh, th this is a uh, extremely uh, resource intensive piece of work to get it right between now and Christmas, if we're to mirror the timelines that, that, that Essex have, have set for them. Um, and we are constantly having uh, chipping away and trying to work with uh, Essex County Council because in the end, we will need to come back to this council at some stage to be able to substantiate whatever is on the table uh, for, for this district. And it's really important that as part of that data sharing that we've asked for the data to be broken down to a district level. So you can see the impact as to Basden Council, whatever the conurbation uh, and options will be. And finally, just to, again, to add to the leader's point around the uh, local recovery element is that the current legislation as it stands is, and this is what's different about this white paper, is that this is about unitaries first, and then those unitaries will decide the CA point, whether that's two or one, and they, it's the unitaries that we set up first, followed by combined authority. So unless the white paper changes that, this is done in tandem and not, so there are two different conversations, and the first is actually around the unitary and configuration, and the, the CA element will be secondary. Uh, thank you, uh, Scott. Paul, do you have anything to add? Nothing to add, Chairman. I thought it was an excellent presentation. <laughs> it's almost like you wrote it. Uh, Councillor Baggett. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it probably won't surprise you that on, on something this big uh, and, and a report that uh, has gone on for a fair amount of time, that there are areas that I do agree with you on and there are areas that I don't agree with you on. Um, I mean, you ended with what you don't know, and, and this is quite crucial to uh, where I'm going to be coming from. What you don't know is anything, the same way as I don't, and, and very, very few people do. We now have a new minister. So really, frankly, we've got no idea how much uh, change might go into the white paper or whether it will stay uh, exactly as written. Uh, and that is a, a major uncertainty. Um, I also speak to other leaders, as you'd expect, and uh, it was interesting to hear the project's fear spin that you were giving about Basildon Council being broken up and people fighting over the scraps and this Machiavellian plan of Essex County Council. Um, I know that you have a, a, a desire to come up with, with a plan uh, before the, the, the government has even told you what the rules are for the plan, but that very much is like the 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 high rise folly going on in the town centre, an idea that, you know, you know what's best um, and you're going to plug on irrespective to what the public or anybody else might might want to say or, or, or see done. Um, but I, I do have a, a number of questions, um, that number being eight. Uh, do you want me to go through them all or do you want me to do them one at a time? Uh, I think um, if, you if you list your questions and if we don't, answer any of them we can we'll come back at the end so list them all and then we'll, we'll take them okay. okay i mean the first one is that um given the still ongoing covid19 issue 
uh, how confident are we that any assumptions that are made about the finances at this hub are actually correct? The second question is what work is being done to align local plans uh, under any new combined authority? I know that there's the planning white paper, but um, what will be the situation with regard to the local plan that we're waiting for the inspector to see uh, and, and other authorities uh, if, uh, as is likely to be the case, uh, local government reform precedes uh, the publication and the, and the appliance of those local plans. Um, it was gratifying to hear that your desire to um, put residents first and, and what I would hope is going to happen is that we actually focus on what the best value and outcome for residents is and any report that is produced uh, I would actually like to see that as one of the highlights of uh, with the options available which of those options actually is best for residents uh, that we are elected currently to serve. Um, I'd also like, and, and it's a big ask, but I'm going to ask you anyway, uh, a commitment that uh, in any discussions you have with government, that you push them to, uh, to write off our HRA debt as part of the arrangements. Um, if you don't ask, you don't get. We are um, not unique, but we are certainly uh, in a situation where we have a, a huge HRA debt around us. And that does affect the financials, even from a, just a housing point of view. Uh, and it's something that we should at least be having a discussion about with government. Um, also curious whether you'll be pushing for a committee system under the method of governance for any new authority, or whether you'd be um, saying that it's, uh, it, it's better to be a, a cabinet system. So what local government uh, method would you be uh, pushing for a new authority? Um, what discussions are taking place about who would supply uh, services like the coroner's service and other services which currently are only supplied by Essex County Council? So how would that, what, what's the thinking behind how those services would be applied uh, or, or dealt with? Um, and, and finally, um, you, you, you spoke about Essex County Council um, running away, spending taxpayers' money on uh, consultants and everything. And yet here in recommendation four, you're proposing to do the same thing. You're proposing to spend taxpayers' money on pushing what is a, a confused agenda for local reform right now without the white paper even being out. And I'm not too sure how uh, your, your drive to actually um, spend the taxpayers' money, which the chief executive just said is going to be a huge resource cost, is any different from castigating Essex County Council for spending taxpayers' money on putting together uh, an option for local government reform. Um, that's the list of questions. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Well, I counted seven. I think you said eight. I counted seven. So, okay. I won't put you in charge of the uh, the maths. Um, all right. Let, let's let's deal with a couple of things uh, right off the bat. Um, there are two things that we need to to establish very clearly. One, the supersized councils are the brainchild of Essex County Council, not of us. Let me say as clearly as we can, uh, this administration does not want to see Basildon Council's residents or businesses in any unitary authority where the council exceeds a population size of 500,000. That, anything above that would be completely wrong. It would be a cumbersome council, it would be um, uh, in agile, it would be inflexible, it would not be able to deliver for our residents. So we will not support anything that goes above half a million. Uh, so let, let's put that firmly on the table. This idea of eight, 900,000, whatever it might be, that is something for the birds as far as we're concerned. The second thing is around the timetable. I, I personally, this administration would be happy to wait for the white paper. But conservative colleagues who run Essex County Council are not happy to wait for the white paper. The reason that both the chief executive and I are on call after call after call every day at the moment is because you have the chief executive of Essex County Council writing an op-ed piece for the MJ where he states that this is going to be a greater Essex combined authority with between two and four unitary authorities, as if it's a done deal, when as far as I'm aware, Gavin Jones doesn't have a majority, he doesn't have an electorate, he's a civil servant. 
acting well above his station, as far as I'm concerned, because not a single councillor of any political stripe anywhere in this county has ever voted for any of these options. And for the leader of Essex County Council to then be sending out copies of the MJ like it was a good thing, I think was a huge mistake. When you've got consultants, PwC, who are working for Essex County Council, and Empower and all these others who are working for the County Council at pace, trying to get data, trying to get letters into government. I mean, David Finch told us just two weeks ago, he wants to write a letter before the white paper is published, outlining what the new unitaries and combined authorities will look like in Essex. That was David Finch who said that. That was not any leader of any district or unitary anywhere else in the county. So I, I don't know what conversations you, you're having with, with David Finch, but if you are having conversations with him, perhaps you would like to relay your view that he should slow down and he should maybe wait for the white paper. But I'm not prepared to allow the train to be leaving the station and the evidence base to work and the, um, the uh, consultants to be pulling all of these uh, proposals together to abolish Basildon Council and for us to just sit here and do nothing. I think that would be a huge dereliction of duty for whomever is the leader of, of, of Basildon Borough Council to just sit here and wait uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks until we get the publication of the white paper. Now, I take the point that there is a new minister, but the first thing the new minister came out and said was that he supports the white paper fully and that he intends to, to bring the white paper with no changes. Luke Hall has been in the department already. He was a junior minister before he was promoted to Minister of State. So this won't be a huge surprise to him. It's not like he's coming from somewhere else. Then when we get down into to the others, I, I, I would say to you, you are, you are asking exactly the right questions that we need to form answers to. You are asking the questions that I want us to have the time and the space to develop policy around, to gather evidence around, to look at the data, to inform what we are doing around, all of which the county are not doing when they're running ahead with their proposal. So when you ask things around the finances and the, um, uh, the kind of the stability of the finances in a post-COVID world, well, I know Owen, I think Owen's still on the call. Owen is working on the, uh, with the FDs across the county, looking at all of this uh, again on a weekly basis. And we are having calls on a weekly basis with finance leads uh, at a member level as well to look at this. But again, the reality is Essex is a very, very diverse county. You know, you, you have places like ourselves and Thurrock, which were economic powerhouses in terms of business rate outputs and everything else. But then you look at some of the other areas. And really, if you haven't got a Basildon, a Thurrock, a Southend, Chelmsford or Colchester in with you, you are struggling in terms of your ability to, to survive economically. That's at a very high level. So how that shapes up with those big five, if you like, that's going to be a key thing that we need to establish and explore. Similarly, on LDPs and JSPs, I'm concerned about what that might happen to them in respect of um, uh, one mayor for the whole of, of the county and the ability of that one mayor to then be able to say to government, give me all of the planning uh, because we don't then have to go and deal with pesky councillors at the district level. We'll just you know, roll out X millions of pounds in an investment and we'll get those houses done, which is why I caution against uh, one uh, combined authority mayor for the whole of Essex. But the reality is on LDPs, there isn't an agreed position at this moment in time because that hasn't even come into the thinking uh, of the counties at the moment. In terms of residents, you know, absolutely, we've, we want to uh, involve them in this whole process. We need to involve businesses in this whole process. Now, I'm fully aware that businesses are very anti the county council and they want a, a more simple uh, a simpler structure of governance in Essex. I think we would all uh, agree with that, but quite what that looks like and what the right solution is needs to be uh, worked out. I take the point about HRA debt, and, and it's not just HRA debt, by the way. You know, Essex County Council have, have come out with this utterly ridiculous figure that COVID is costing them £175 million, pounds, that there's a black hole that's emerged at County Hall of £175 million. Pounds. Now, I mean, Owen will, will tell me if... if you know, I'm speaking out of turn here, but I can't see how that is the case when you've got other places with much higher deprivation needs 
uh, in other cities across this country where they are nowhere near 175 million pounds. But that debt will then need to be factored into uh, the thinking. So will the reserves and the slice of the reserves that they hold at County Hall, that will also need to be uh, factored in as well. So we need, we need to get into some of that. You talk about governance systems and what that might look like. We don't even know we're merging with yet. Uh, I, I maintain the principle of a committee system is more democratic. Uh, it is a better way of doing business. These very conversations we are having now, which are available for the public to watch on YouTube on an iPhone or an iPad, is a hell of a lot better than you know a, bu a bunch of middle-aged white men sitting in a room behind closed doors, you know, deciding what they're going to do at a cabinet, um, which is what happened for years and years and years. So you know, I would be pushing for a committee system. Uh, whatever the, the situation. In terms of coroner service, in terms of uh, other county functions, not just waste collection, but waste disposal. And we, of course, we know about the possible plans for a, a new waste plant in uh, Pitsy that we hope that uh, Conservative colleagues will stop up at Essex County Council in the weeks ahead. Uh, and there's a very strong case now that they've uh, moved to abolish themselves, that they, they should be putting a pin in that. Uh, and we've been pushing them to do that as well. Uh, we, we need answers from them on, on what happens there. Uh, and then you talked about spending of taxpayers' money, and I think the point that I made was around mandate. You know, these are supposed to be political decisions. These are supposed to be decisions taken by politicians. Whether you agree with them, you don't agree with them. These are supposed to be councils that run these, and we are elected members who are supposed to do that. We have had a principle under, you know, this administration, the previous alliance, and under the previous Conservative administration to back a seller. And we've done that in the budget and we've done that repeatedly in the JSP that you as leader adopted into the LDP uh, when you sat in this chair. What has not happened in all of this is there hasn't been a vote anywhere in Essex to move it on to start now looking at the whole Essex wide proposal, whether that's driven by uh, Essex County Council or whether that's what I'm calling a seller plus. The, the districts in the north who want to be part of that alternative proposal. And what we're seeking to do here tonight is get some validation from members democratically elected to give us the permission to go and look at what they're doing and spend some money. I think, you know, given I'm supposed to be in a county full of fiscal conservatives, I think I'm the only leader at the moment who's actually uh, seeking to protect the taxpayer and the public purse. Uh, in, in terms of bringing forward a, a proper democratic plan for, for uh, expending some money. So it, that is around mandate uh, and, the, and the ability to do this. Scott, I don't know if I've, I've missed anything from Councillor Baggett's uh, list of questions that, that you want to, to add in, and then perhaps I'll bring Councillor Baggett in after that. Um, just, just really, Leader, I think I mean, you said it yourself, but I think Councillor Baggett is, has made some uh, really important points and that's the thing we're trying to unravel in terms of the work streams Andy and I think um, I think from an office perspective we need to validate all of this and the work streams and some of that have been around the transition so that I would see that as oh, the next phase so I think in terms of the first phase is actually understanding how the land has come up with some high level propositions for leaders then um, of Essex to decide what are those propositions that they want to do a more deeper dive which is what I call phase two where we'll then have those work streams that would look at some of those details you said in more detail around particularly around the, the local plans and how that that's impacted but so i think those are all the right points you've raised but i have to say at the moment those work streams have not been developed we're not at that stage yet but certainly we can give regular update updates on that um and i think really as i say some of those questions for me would be then the next even the phase beyond that about transition so once um uh, government effectively uh, agree in in some of the uh, how the units should be formed then you look at how would you transition to that so those services how would they be disbanded um, out across Essex depending on whether that's two three four or five unitaries that will be once obviously that will be the transition stage once we're clear that government have backed whatever that final decision is um, so that's why I think it's probably a for me, three phases. So really the first one is a very high level, understanding the data, understanding what the options are, realistic they are. And then it's actually, as, as officers have been saying, it's for members to decide based on um, principles, based on propositions. And there is no right or wrong for this, um, but obviously officers like Owen need to say actually whether it's financially sustainable. And then beyond that, it's then for members to decide. Then we move into a more detailed work streams about how would that actually work? And then once government, as you say, have agreed those, 
then it's the transition and the detail of how we'd split up Essex County and effectively form a new council. So how would we even split some of the services here, which will take some time. And, 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 and again, I, I would say to members of this committee and, and group leaders, look at what has happened in those other areas, in BCP and uh, in Buckinghamshire and in Northamptonshire. It is complicated. Um, and, and it isn't, you know, I can't sit here tonight, six weeks after I was told that the county are abolishing themselves and bringing all of these proposals forward at the pace they are. I can't sit here and answer all of those questions, but the purpose of doing this, and, you know, I commit, and Karina remind me of this, but I want to bring an update report to every PNR uh, this side of Christmas at the very least. Um, you know, we will continue to, to let people know about what is being discussed and decided when. But, Councillor Bagger, I think you wanted to come back. Yeah, thank you. And, and you're right, Chairman, I did only give you seven. Uh, the eighth question I have actually is linked to one of the questions you didn't quite answer. So I'll, I'll round them up at the end. But um, I, I do appreciate your, your, your lack of understanding of irony when you talk about middle aged men sitting in rooms making decisions without the public being involved, having sat on a cellar for the last year, a group of middle aged men sitting in a room where there's not even any minutes produced. Uh, or any form of governance or any form of mandate and you, you went on then to talk about the mandate that Essex County don't have and I'm just curious where uh, you think a seller has that mandate given that they haven't consulted with the public or gone to the public either so it's it's a bit of a, a horses for courses thing there however the question I was going to ask um, and it's tied with the, the, the one you didn't answer um, it's just and, 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 and I genuinely hope that the, the answer will be positive here uh, I just want an assurance from you that you will ensure that any redistribution of our assets um, going forward won't result in any financial loss to the residents uh, of this council. Um, and secondly, uh, you said that you understood my point about the HRA. What I actually asked for was a commitment to actually push for uh, that debt being waived. And so I ask again, will you uh, give a commitment to at least raise that with the government? Uh, and also, will you give a commitment that you will ensure that any redistribution of assets doesn't result in a financial loss to our residents? Okay, um, I am very concerned that at the age of 31, you can be accused of being middle-aged. So that's uh, that's the first point that I'm not having um, when it comes to maths, because otherwise it is all downhill. Um, in terms of mandate, I would say um, the MOU that we signed in January 2018 uh, provides the foundation and the basis for which uh, a seller operates uh, and of course you'll know uh, that we did push uh, for a seller minutes to start being published which they are uh, starting to be now uh, and that was something that I raised uh, consistently that I thought that these meetings should be held in public uh, I thought that there should be uh, lots of questions asked that's why when I was in opposition I asked you lots of questions and I expect the same uh, to be asked of, of me now uh, as well as the minutes and, and some of the meetings being made uh, more public but I certainly think the MOU that we signed gives us that framework and the fact that we have uh, taken budget reports uh, through the council and given consent for um, money to be spent on it and obviously the joint strategic plan that your administration passed. Uh, in terms of um, redistribution of assets absolutely uh, we do want to ensure that there is no financial loss uh, to residents or businesses uh, of Basildon. I am concerned and I will be brutally honest with you I am concerned here that the figures, and this is why the data protocol might not be the sexiest thing in the world, but it is so important. Uh, I am concerned about the uh, characterization that 97% of deprivation in this county somehow belongs to the south of the borough, uh, and that there's only 3% of deprivation in the north of the borough. Uh, sorry, north of the county I'm, I'm talking about. I'm very concerned by that, and I'm very, uh, mindful of the need to challenge that data uh, because I don't want to see us being lumbered with um, excessive debt and we've alluded to the COVID debt but of course other debt as well from the county uh, and we will need to be extremely mindful of that. In terms of the HRA absolutely I commit I will raise that so will Councillor Smith through, through his, his position as well I'm sure uh, we will be happy to, to do that as part of the negotiations and there's a whole there's a whole uh, mantra uh, what we may as councillors decide we want to do one of the things that didn't happen in in those other examples of, of the different geographies that have done this elsewhere nobody asked for a transformation fund uh, nobody uh, asked for a transformation loan off of the government they should have done that 
um, because that's landed them into real hot water. So it's literally been cut and dry on day one. Uh, I would hope that we would be a bit smarter than that uh, and that we would uh, look at how we can work with the Treasury uh, in a different way. So uh, all of that needs to be uh, thrashed out. Uh, watch this space uh, for how we will look to bring some of that forward. Uh, and I commit that I will update members uh, every single PNR uh, as we move forward. Uh, I have Councillor Harrison. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Can I first of all thank you can, and uh, the Chief Executive the way you've outlined this report. Can I, I listen to Councillor Baggett and I think he's asked some really interesting and good questions. But one of the things he said at the beginning was, I would agree with some of this, not everything as you would expect. Can I ask him, because the most important recommendation there tonight of the seven, in my view, is recommendation five. That I would hope that all members would support that recommendation because it is saying clearly we would oppose any unitary council that exceeds half a million population. Any unitary council that breaks up the Thames estuary region and any proposal for a great greater Essex combined authority. Because if this council is not unanimous on that, that particular rec recommendation. I feel the County Council will have a wedge to drive between members. And I would hope that that is one of the areas where Councillor Bagger is in agreement with this administration. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Harrison. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I mean, so far, apart from some minor points, I think we're all trying to work for the residents here. And I'd like to pick up what Councillor Harrison made reference to with regards to item recommendation 5.a. Now, as you know, I'm a county council. What I've heard, this could be fake news, but one of the possible twinnings we might get with Basildon is our neighbours, Farrock, Brentwood, which could work. You know, we're very close to each other. There's some points we share. But added on to that, Epping and Harlow, because they're cash-strapped. And... What would happen then, and I think this has not been picked up in the debate so far, once this boundary has been agreed, however it looks for these new unitary authorities, the local government boundary commission is unleashed to draw up, draw up the new wall boundaries. Now, if we were Harlow, Epping, Brentwood, Furrock and Basildon, Basildon as we know it, when I say Basildon as we know it, I'm talking about a bit of Rick and Rick as well, might end up with 10 or 12 councillors. That's crazy, absolutely crazy. I mean, if your councillor goes away on holiday in August, you know, it's a lot of, it puts constituents in a bit of a tight spot and that councillor might feel guilty about taking their holiday in August. So I think Farrick and Basildon, we could probably get away with. Anything more, I think Brentwood, we could just about do, but any more than that, we will lose effective representation or we're going to need a super-sized town hall. And where does the benefit there? Having a 100-member strong authority. There's no need for it. I think Farrick and Basel works pretty well. The A13, we link up. There are parts of 127 we need to address. But you can't have a council possibly going as far north as Harlow, up to the edge um, with South Benf uh, North Bay of South Benfield. It's crackers. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Smith, and, and uh, it, it is not uh, fake news. Uh, that was one of the proposals that was being floated, uh, and I think that, that demonstrates the kind of size uh, that could potentially be on the table for these super unitary authorities, which uh, I know we're against. I, I know that Councillor Headley has indicated, but uh, I should have gone back to Councillor Baggett because he was asked that direct question from Councillor Harrison, so uh, I'll give Councillor Baggett the opportunity to respond. Now, I'll tell you why we're not going to support that, uh, and it, it, it's very, very simple. If the white paper was out, and having seen the white paper, uh, we were able to say, yeah, we can make a, a, a value decision here on what's right for residents, on what the tax take is, what the actual tax spend is, on the, the really important and crucial things that we're making a decision on, then yeah, I, I, I might be minded to, to agree it. But what we're asking to do is to say, this is what we don't agree with when we haven't seen any evidence whether one of those options could actually turn out 
to be the right thing for residents. It could turn out to be, that I, I'm using an example, and it, it's, it's, it's the, the best I can't be right now. A unitary authority of 510,000 people could be the absolute best thing since sliced bread. And we've written a letter saying we're absolutely against it. Uh, it's it's uh, being very premature, and it's for that reason, and, and th that's the main reason that we wouldn't be supporting writing that letter at this point. Okay, I mean, I, I take the point about tax bases and, and financial sustainability. I mean, but what you can't get away from is the numbers will be the numbers, uh, and and the populations will remain what the populations are. I did allude in the um, in the presentation to the fact that this is a, an, an opening statement. This is an opening set of negotiation uh, criteria, and if you do start to look at the different populations and the different numbers, uh, I think you'll find that you're either going from around four hundred and fifty very quickly towards 650 uh, if you uh, if you start to add in some of the geographies that councillor uh, smith was talking about so um, i'm not i'm not in agreement that uh, at this stage the council's opening gambit that it would not go above half a million and that it would seek to um, retain the integrity of the thames estuary region which i think we would all agree is an economic powerhouse of a region uh, seeking to retain its uh, uh, its character, but also to say very clearly, we are against the county-wide CA. Um, I'm not sure what you'll learn in a white paper uh, buried within it that will change your mind on that, but I accept that um, there are issues of uh, patronage uh, at the county hall that may determine uh, some of the thinking. Councillor Headley, you have indicated. Thank you, Leader. Um, can I just respectfully suggest that um, we do have people listening on YouTube, is my understanding, this is being live streamed. Uh, can all of us try and avoid the use of acronyms? And it's, all, it's not too bad for those of us that are involved with the detail, but um, you've used several acronyms tonight, which may not be obviously um, known to the people that might be listening. But that aside, I did declare an interest as a county councillor, and I am a member of the party that is in administration at County Hall. The work that the county are currently undertaking, and I do chair audit the county, is in preparation. It's preparatory work in advance of the white paper. And I think it's incumbent on any administration to do as much preparatory work as they can when there's going to be reorganisation potentially on the scale that you are talking about. Uh, with all due respect to Councillor Smith, I think worrying about um, rumours that he's heard about who might join with who is a waste of his time, to be honest. What we should be concentrating on is working with county and other authorities to try and find some common ground on which we could go forward. And the danger is that if we argue amongst ourselves to the extent that there isn't common ground, it's entirely possible that the reorganisation will be done to us rather than with us. Thank you, uh, Councillor Headley. I, I, uh, I hope that that is a message that is feeding upwards uh, as well from the Conservative group uh, in Basildon uh, towards uh, the uh, administration in, in uh, Chelmsford. Um, I, I do just want to ask, I mean, you, you say that because you're, you're on the audit and, and standards board there that this is preparatory work for LGR. Perhaps you could tell the committee when you were first made aware of the work that the county were doing on this. The county have been doing this um, for some time, but I'm not going to speak um, outside of the county, you know, the confines of county. Certain information is not in the public domain at the moment. There are a number of work streams that aren't completed, and I'm sure the county will share those with the leaders of other councils as soon as they're able. And again, I would encourage you to uh, engage with Councillor Finch, the leader at County. And can I just say there is a danger in all of this. Um, if we do end up with two, three, four, however many combined authorities, that the economies of scale will mean that a number of town halls will disappear and there will be a rationalisation of not only elected members, I think currently in Essex, there's probably about 400 elected members. That is likely to be 
reduced by 75%. And in the same vein, all council officers currently employed by those 14 um, district, county, city, uh, borough authorities will have to, I guess, apply for their own jobs in the new authorities. And there's likely to be an awful lot of um, angst around that. And I think in fairness to our officers, we need to have a grasp of what this reorganisation will mean in terms of economy of scale and the reorganisation of local government, which for some of us is long overdue. I wouldn't have chosen to do it at this particular time, given the um, work that the government are trying to do with Brexit and COVID. I think the timing of this is uh, particularly awkward. But yes, there are a number of um, conversations taking place at county, and there are a number of dual-hatted leaders. Um, the leader of Braintree Council happens to be a county council member, and there are others. There are senior min members of administrations in Colchester that are cabinet members. So there are conversations going on. I'm obviously not privy to all of them, and even if I was, I wouldn't be sharing at this moment. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm just intrigued by the idea about for some time. I will come to you in a moment, Councillor Smith. I, I'm intrigued by that answer about for some time. We, we are, myself and, and the Chief Executive, are aware of the work streams. Uh, we're aware of the engagement exercises that are taking place uh, with Councillor Finch. Uh, I, I do say the idea that we would reduce uh, 400 members to 100 members covering 1.9 million people uh, in the county, I don't think speaks to uh, a huge... Uh, I don't think that speaks to this being a democratic uh, exercise. I think that's uh, more about cost cutting. I take the point about officers and, and the chief executive and, and uh, the deputy chief executive have been uh, engaged in internal comms uh, on that very point uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks uh, to work with um, work with our uh, officers here to understand exactly what this all means and the time scales that we're working towards. But I do think that the irony uh, won't be lost on, on the public or on members that when it's the county council that are doing it, uh, it is prudent and it is uh, preparatory work and that's what they should be doing. And then when we do it, like we did back in January, and then we put money into the budget so that we here in Basildon were ready for LGR, it was a gross abuse of the, the budget. We shouldn't be doing it and that we should be taking the money out of the budget. Um, I don't think I'll be the only one uh, surprised that the tune changes when the county are dictating uh, what Conservative members should be thinking and saying. Councillor Smith. Just very briefly through yourself, Mr Chair, Councillor Headley said I heard a rumour and I shouldn't listen to rumours, but you did confirm them, didn't you, that the talk was, at Essex, was to merge Basildon with Harlow, Epping, Brentford and our immediate neighbours in Farrick. That is correct, isn't it, Mr Chairman? Uh, that is, uh, Councillor Smith. It's one of many proposals that are being prepared that range from two to four uh, authorities. And we, uh, I am hoping now that the Chief Executive has informed us that the data protocol has been agreed and signed today, that we may actually start to underpin some of those uh, presumptions with a bit of evidence that will enable us to make informed decisions as members. Uh, the Chief Executive is waving. Yeah, I just want to um, confirm to all members that uh, whenever we get to the stage of the, the end of the first stage, all of those propositions that, that you've outlined, which county started off saying they were, were going to look at two to four, which, as I said, two councils at least said, could they model five? All the conurbations, every council was asked. Uh, and again, it, we have an opportunity. If there are any uh, options that members want to consider, uh, we can put that in, in the mix of, of it. So you will get back, and I think the leader has, has confirmed there that uh, various PNR committees will bring you updates because this is a moving piece, as I said. So you will get in front of you all of, of the, through the data sharing, the propositions that both uh, Essex uh, County Council uh, are working on, uh, which obviously officers are, are, are involved in. And so you'll get them before you to see those propositions. And again, uh, obviously, if the council decides it, it needs to, at the right time, look at other options, then we will bring those back. So all members will see those options. And again, I come back to the most important point is that members will decide uh, of all councils at the right time on those propositions as we get them. Uh, and 
the current timeline as stipulated that uh, the leader and Paul put up earlier is, is December. That may move depending on the white paper. And, I, and unfortunately, until I know that's out, I can't really confirm if that date changes. Thank you. Councillor Bagot. Thank you, Chair. It's a point of clarity, really, and it, it's more for all the public that I'm sure are watching enthralled with this uh, discussion about local government reform. Um, but where we had an issue with the money being spent, it's nothing to do with Essex County, it's right and, and you're wrong. Uh, you were wanting to put money in for uh, pushing what was then an seller agenda to form a combined authority in order to get infrastructure, which had actually nothing to do with local government reform. It was a, a purely separate uh, issue. Uh, and we were critical of that. Um, what we're now saying, and, and I, I did say this earlier, what's confusing to me is that you were pushing the seller option. Then you wrote a letter to residents saying that a shadow combined authority wasn't the way anymore. It was actually a Thames gateway model. Now we're going back and you're saying that what you want to do is what you want to do is 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 this this piece of work, and that to us it seems that what you're doing is spending what the chief executive has confirmed is a lot of resource when really you're making it up as you go along, it seems. And, and that's not a prudent use of, of council money. Uh, and also when it comes to rumours, I think the point that Councillor Hadley was saying is that there are rumours flying around and all of us would be better minded to concentrate on the facts where we can get them or the version of the facts we presented rather than rumours. Because if we want to talk about rumours, I heard a rumour that Councillor Callaghan and Councillor Ingalls were in deep conversation about joining Basildon and, and, and Harlow together because it was a, it would then create uh, two uh, major uh, powerhouses uh, and, and that was an agenda that was being discussed and pushed. Do I believe that? No, it's a rumour and therefore I would give Councillor Callaghan the courtesy of coming and telling us if he was having that sort of discussion with, with his colleague uh, over there. So the point is that uh, Councillor Headley was making, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn for him, is that we should be concentrating on the matter of hand rather than what's going to become a plethora of rumours flying around uh, as talks continue. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Bagger. I hope you weren't speaking out of turn for Councillor uh, Headley either, otherwise you'll end up uh, with all sorts of problems at your group. Um, in terms of this letter, I've no idea uh, what letter it is that you keep referring to uh, this evening. Clearly, uh, you've got in your head that there's been a letter uh, that's gone out regarding uh, the Acela proposal and, and where we are. Um, the thing that I struggle with sometimes when it comes to this is just basic details. So in, in January, we brought to this committee a report that looked at unitary Basildon that was over the top of, or, or, sorry, un, unitary Basildon was underneath a combined authority that was over the top of the South Essex region. Uh, that is entirely consistent with the administration's policy to divorce Essex County Council, which is what we uh, proposed. You were against it because you didn't want to divorce Essex County Council. We heard on the night in January a range of opinion on that, but we then put into the budget monies that would enable us to continue to look at LGR. I, I, not that I've read the Conservative Party manifesto in any great detail, but I am aware that on page 29 of your manifesto at the election held on the 12th of December, uh, you actually pledged local government reorganisation. Uh, I'm also aware of the Queen's speech that followed uh, that general election, in which at the Queen's speech, you promised that you would bring forward within the parliamentary session a bill on devolution. Uh, so therefore, Basel and Council has simply sought to put Basel and Council's residents and businesses in the strongest possible position by establishing what the new norm might look like. Now, whether that was a single unitary Basildon or as this is now evolving, a merger with other councils as part of a unitarization uh, you know, policy from central government. But let's be really, really clear. That's why we put the money in the budget. Uh, and I, I just say, on the one hand, the county are praised for uh, their great preparatory work. And then on the other hand, this administration, which is actually trying to look out for your constituents and your businesses, is derided uh, for putting that money in the budget. It seems like an odd position to me. When you say making it up as we go along, I, I don't think anyone, whether it's the chief executive or whether it's myself, I don't think any of us would sit here and even try to pretend that we have a clue as to the answer to all of these questions. We absolutely do not. 
Uh, and as I've said multiple times already tonight, we would be quite happy if the pace, if, if the foot came off the accelerator, the pace was slowed down and we were able to spend a bit more time looking at this. But it's your colleagues up at County Hall who are so determined to press ahead with getting their proposal in before the 23rd of December, that it means that we cannot afford to sit here and do nothing, which is what a failure to endorse these principles and proposals tonight would mean for our borough. I have no other member uh, who has indicated uh, to speak. Uh, so the recommendations are across page 31 uh, and 32 this evening. Can I ask members to unmute themselves? Chairman, can, are we doing them on block or can we take them separately? Uh, we've got it. Well, they might as well do them on block, to be honest, because there's not really a point in. Uh, what, what's your rationale? Uh, the fact that we will vote for some of it and not all of it. <laughs> I mean, that's not really a good enough reason, to be honest. You know, ducking and diving from the difficult bits, but just uh, skirting around the easy bits. We're going to take them on block. Uh, everyone, uh, unmute yourselves. I will kick things off uh, and I will vote in favour. Councillor Smith? In favour. Brown? In favour. Councillor McGurran? In favour. Councillor Baggett? Against. Councillor Headley? Against. Councillor Sullivan? Against. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, uh, Scott, for uh, your support with that uh, agenda item. The vote has been carried. Uh, four votes to three. Uh, this council has a policy now uh, that it will be against any council, uh, being forced into any council of over half a million, uh, and we are against a single mayor to cover the whole of this county. Uh, clear blue water between the parties. Uh, Agenda item seven is the standards arrangement, the appointment of the independent persons. I was informed prior to the meeting that the vice chair of the standards board uh, is seeking to attend, but I don't think he's in the waiting room, is he? No, he's not, Chairman, no. Very good, it could have got awkward. Uh, so page 39 to 41 uh, is the report on the joint standards uh, board. Uh, Paul, as the monitoring officer, do you have anything to uh, add to the report? Uh, nothing to add to the report. I'm happy to do an introduction if need be, but otherwise um, self-explanatory. Okay. The rec I mean, the recommendations, does any member have any questions on the recommendation? Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr Chairman. When we go to item two, could the vote be split? Because there's one I would like to support and one I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, I'm, in fact, I'm going to uh, look at um, uh, recommendation one on block and then separating uh, in recommendation two. So we take uh, three votes in total here. Councillor Baggett is waving at me. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm then the consistency of uh, taking one set of votes on block, because otherwise it's ducking and diving, and then taking another one separately, which clearly is not ducking and diving, just the consistency of the chairman. I just wanted to clarify that uh, I, I was reading that situation right. I'm always happy to correct you, Councillor Baker. We are talking about individuals here, not policy. Uh, and therefore that is the uh, difference that you seek. Members who don't have any uh, questions uh, on this, can I ask you to unmute yourself? Uh, recommendation one, uh, I will ask uh, members, uh, to vote on this uh, and uh, I will kick things off and vote in favour. Councillor Smith? In favour. Councillor Brown? In favour. Councillor McGarren? In favour. Councillor Baggett? In favour. Councillor Headley? Abstain. Councillor Sullivan? In favour. Recommendation two, uh, to intend to recommend to council uh, that Mr Horn and Mr Beasley be reappointed. I'm going to take a vote firstly uh, on Mr Horn, and then I'll take a vote on Mr Beasley. If I can ask members uh, to... Uh, point of order, Chairman. You may ask, yes. Um, as the actual recommendation is only that we noted, surely the recommendation is going to need to be changed if you're going to actually vote for something other than noting. It's, uh, that's a very good point, Councillor. Um, perhaps your first of the night, uh, in which case I will uh, amend uh, the recommendation or propose an amendment to the recommendation 
uh, that the committee uh, endorses uh, the monitoring officer's intention to recommend to council that Mr. Beasley be reappointed as an independent person for a further two year period, ending in October, 2022, and we delete Mr. Hall. Do I have a seconder for that amendment? Councillor Smith has seconded that amendment. In which case I'll now put recommendation two to the vote. If I can ask members to uh, please unmute themselves. Uh, so the uh, recommendation uh, so we have to take a vote on the on the amendment, uh, in which case we'll vote on the amendment. I vote in favour. Councillor Smith. In favour. Councillor Brown. In favour. Councillor McGarren. In favour. Councillor Baggett. Against. Councillor Headley. Against. Councillor Sullivan. Against. Thank you. The amendment is carried, uh, in which case we'll vote now on the recommendation as amended. Uh, that this committee endorses the monitoring officer's intention to recommend to council that Mr. Peter Beasley, Beasley be reappointed as an independent person for a further three years ending in October 2022. I vote in favour. Councillor Smith? In favour. Councillor Brown? In favour. Councillor McGarren? In favour. Councillor Baggett? Abstain. Councillor Headley? Abstain. Councillor Sullivan? Abstain. Thank you, members. The vote is carried. Uh, agenda item eight is the Local Government Ombudsman and Social Care Annual Letter of 2019. Uh, I believe the Monitoring Officer is going to present this report as well. Over to you, Paul. Uh, yes, Chairman, um, annual report from the, the, from the Ombudsman. Um, <clears throat> we... Uh, required, the report sets out legislation in terms of uh, reporting any findings in maladministration as they occur, but where there's a, a considered to be a fairly minor and have been settled by the council, those can be picked up through the annual report. There was two of those this year, and there's a brief summary in the report. Uh, comparison with last year's figures is set out. Um, it's just for the uh, committee to know. We also draw reference to the Housing Ombudsman Service, and just to give a broad overview of um, complaints which have been dealt with by the Housing Ombudsman, um, but those will be reported to the um, Housing and Communities Committee as well for it to have oversight of, of those matters within its remit. Um, the report is, is for noting a requirement that the Council doesn't note it, particularly in those two findings of, of service failure as, as set out in the report. Um, but as I say, it's just for, for noting. Uh, thank you uh, to the monitoring officers. Does any member have a question on this? No, uh, in which case uh, the report has been duly noted. Uh, thank you to the monitoring officer. The work programme is agenda item nine. It's set out on pages 53 to 56. Uh, just to add uh, from uh, earlier on uh, in our discussions and debate, uh, I do intend in October to bring a report on uh, local lockdown uh, and our procedures for a local lockdown as a council uh, and then uh, I will also add on to that um, a verbal update on uh, a seller uh, and uh, I mean we call it a seller you know just keep it as a seller and then if it stretches beyond that to LGR uh, more uh, broadly then we can do that are there any other members who have uh, items that they wish to add scrutinize Silence on scrutiny. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, well, we'll add those two things. Oh, Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, pardon. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Carry on. I thought we'd jump ahead to the work programme. Beg your pardon. We are on the work programme. Oh. <laughs> right. Well, in which case, um, to clarify. Um, that I will vote against because as far as scrutiny goes for the umpteenth and last time, we are a policy and a strategy committee and you need a separate committee to that to be able to scrutinise the activities of it. And that's the last time I'll say it. Thank you. All right, I get that. But do you have any policy issues that you might want to put on there, no? No? Okay, brilliant. Any other, uh, Aidan, uh, Councillor McGowan, you will wave at me then. Yeah, just a, a minor point on page 55 of the work program right at the top, it says potential management of Essex County Council Traveller site. I may be mistaken, but didn't Essex do a turnaround on that 
and are not planning to dispose of any sites now, in which case, if that is the case, does it need to be there? That's true. That was an acquisition, wasn't it? Um, do we have any any real uh, substantive on that? I believe, as Councilor McGowan has said, they've withdrawn that, so we don't need to do an acquisition. Karina? I can check that with the officer tomorrow, and then I could, I'll remove it if necessary. Okay. That's okay. Fine. Yeah. Councillor Harrison. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Although not a member of the committee, I just wonder if this committee should be uh, looking at the future of the Tovey site, which is owned by the County Council, and what's happening there in relate as it's in the borough, and now that the County Council are being got some money back for it, and the company have gone into administration, uh, it does affect the borough quite a lot. And I think it, there should be a policy discussion on where we go with that. Yeah, no, I, I uh, fully appreciate the, the intricacies around Tovey. Um, uh, in the first instance, energy infrastructure would come under strategic planning and infrastructure uh, or inclusive growth as it is at the moment. <laughs> so uh, it will go to uh, that committee um, and uh, will be picked up by the Chair of Strategic Planning and Infrastructure. So if there is a need to talk about disposals, acquisitions, any of that thing, then yes, absolutely, it'll come back here. Councillor Bagger. Yeah, um, I'd like to add an item on if I can, because far be, far be it for me not to engage the administration. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like um, uh, maybe for members to receive a report on the Malmo trade mission, uh, lessons learned and uh, what, uh, you know, th th has happened as a result of that. Uh, and a report on the trade mission to the United States, what's been learned, uh, what discussions were had, um, et cetera, et cetera. The sort of things you'd expect in an open and transparent organization, members to be kept informed about. And I'm sure, Councillor Baggett, that you read in detail the Global Basildon Report that was going to the uh, then Strategic Planning and Infrastructure Committee, and that is on the uh, work programme for uh, the External Affairs Committee, which has economic development uh, within it. So, of course, Global Basildon falls within that. Uh, and subject to COVID, there would have been a full report that went to the committee, uh, which I'm sure we can pick up uh, at that stage. And that committee will look at it. Uh, and then if there are any further recommendations to make to this committee, they can do so. Any other member with any other item? Just one, um, Councillor. Um, I've got Councillor Sullivan on the phone. Uh, his internet connection has gone. I can see him. Yes. But, oh. There's a certain uh, irony near there, but I'm saying nothing. Can you hear us, Stuart? Does he need yes, to it's okay. Him? Yes, okay. All right, okay, brilliant. All right, look, the recommendation on page 53 is to consider and endorse. So, can I ask members to unmute themselves as we take a vote on the work program? I'll kick things off and vote in favour. Councillor Smith? In favour. Councillor Brown? In favour. Councillor McGarren? In favour. Councillor Baggett? Against. Councillor Headley? Okay. You sound as surprised as the rest of us. Councillor Sullivan. Against. Full house. Uh, thankfully, there is a work programme that has been uh, adopted and passed, uh, so we will continue the business of the council, even if our colleagues don't wish to take part. Uh, agenda item two, uh, to protect the commercially, commercial sensitivities for the council, uh, it is a view to uh, exclude the public and the press as we consider uh, the uh, agreement for uh, our enterprise agreement, our license agreement with Microsoft uh, afterwards. So can I ask members again to unmute themselves as we take a vote on whether to exclude the press and the public. Uh, I vote in favour. Councillor Smith. In favour. Councillor Brown. In favour. Councillor McGowan. In favour. Councillor Baggett. Nice to see Councillor Smith being consistent against. Oh dear, someone's not getting their pills. Councillor Headley. Against. Councillor Sullivan. Against. Can I ask Democratic Services, in the interest of protecting the taxpayer, 
can we now please uh, turn the live stream off so we can continue our meeting in part two. Thank you to the watching thousands. Okay, I'll complete that for you now.